So we had a lively discussion, actually lots of people were there. Um, so my summary of it was, first as we discussed previously, this is not an academic book, um, it's something else. And we brought the most probable name as Program Advisory Group, uh, because that's what it should be doing, it's not, uh, it's not in my <coughs> standards. Uh, we thought it was really then about guidance as to where priorities should go and we seeking to avoid duplication of effort. Uh, that it was focused more at the program, um, so that's the degree or such award level, rather than at the course, i.e. module or subject level. Um, so it's really advising on, should we help you think about how building blocks go together. Um, the other thing that we in discussion was thinking about the marketing aspects. So what is the demand out there? Uh, what would be viable? programs that could be put together, how it's going to be made to fly, and how it is going to um, meet our discussion between the, uh, the um, President's Council and the individual institutions. Uh, the other points that were made was there's the opportunity to broker international collaboration cheaply, which could be an attractive product. So we talked about, uh, well, I was talking about uh, a jointly constructed MBA, but that being model could be expanded. Um, we, have, we talked about we need to look after the interests of students, so whilst it's possible that we could put the program up, which is effectively low risk to the institutions, if someone spends two years studying that and the program disappears, that's a potential risk for them if they can't take the program on something else. Uh, we also spend quite a bit of time talking about what is going to be financially viable and effective for the institutions and what's going to work, and that this group would hopefully help in the discussion around that. That's all the notes I took, so. David, if you've got more up there. Um, yeah, let's see. Well, we definitely we definitely decided that that the, the advisory group, the program advisory group would have a coordinating role, not in any sort of uh, approval capacity. Um, and one of the goals was, I think you already mentioned, was to um, avoid duplication of effort among partners. So the idea was that any one partner could solve a problem once and then everyone would learn from that without having to make some learning mistakes themselves. Um, uh, we talked about using a pull model rather than a push model in terms of, of decision making rather than everyone needing to uh, agree to a course of action. Instead, individual uh, actors could, could try things and, and people would be drawn to what works. So for example, if someone, if someone uh, takes a chance and with an initiative and it turns out that they're actually, um, they found it to be viable and are making money, then it becomes easy for other partners to uh, adopt a similar strategy. Uh, and they can even learn from the way that it was done by the uh, successful partners. Um, yeah, it was, uh, we, we, we focus on the idea of competition rather than, than competition. Um, Yeah, the, the, there was the, the point that we could all uh, benefit from, from membership in the network by um, by virtue of increasing not not only um, not only from from revenue generation but also by improved efficiencies in offering uh, in offering courses that are um, more streamlined as a result of the, the refinement that they get through the network. Uh, but similarly, we could also benefit from being able to offer we could afford to offer long tail of, of courses which might have much lower numbers, but because of the efficiencies uh, that were achieved in some of the higher volume courses, we can also afford to run the, the long tail of, of lower volume courses. Um, 
We also talked a little bit about the idea that we need to, um, and this might have, been, might have been my caprice here to put this in, but um, a way of capturing the lore of the group, because one of the things we have to acknowledge is that there's going to be a churn or a, a turnover in the group of people that are involved in this going forward. So not all of us will appear, we'll be at the next meeting, for example, there'll be new people, and we need to come up with a way of ensuring that what we've learned tacitly as a group can somehow be passed on to other people so that they don't have to, um, they're, not, they're not trying to work out what was already decided and discussed in previous sessions. Um, so so we, we, we encourage anyone who ha has a, a barred um, uh, tendency to uh, feel free to wax lyrical. Um, so yeah, blog, blogs and various other forms of expression uh, to characterize what has gone on here and to tell stories is, is, is something we think is very valuable. Um, we also talked about points of difference that we have as a network. Um, the, the idea was, was mooted of, of having, uh, similar to the software industry, having round-the-clock development with teams in each time zone. You could also have around-the-clock high availability tutorial services. So that someone could be studying at any time of day or night and they could access someone in somewhere in the world virtually that could provide them with tutorial support. Um, there's an implicit value uh, of being involved in an international co uh, collaboration. And so you know, that is inherently a value. Um, there's also the ability of the network to benefit rapidly from any successful initiative undertaken by any individual partner. And that partners will know how to participate and leverage opportunities more readily than non-participating partners, so people who aren't in the network, because we'll know the mechanisms by which the interaction works. Um, participation is optional and is based on enlightened self-interest. Um, and also, there's an advantage with regard to risk and ongoing cost of contributing to, uh, as well as drawing from the network's resources. And that's all I have. Uh, one thing I should mention also is that we, the TLR as written, uh, is it's not an academic board, uh, you know, we're intended as a school um, and therefore our projects are all need to be rewritten. We didn't actually specify that as an academic board. I think that's an issue we yeah. should take forward the CEO's meeting is to give some sort of indication of taking that process forward. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Any questions, comments? Well, then let's take uh, feedback then from group. Okay. I'll sit here if you don't mind. And see the huge objections. Uh, so the first point is how can the OERU improve, and then we change that to provide because there really isn't any. So how can OERU provide OERU, or maybe we should say enhance or stimulate whatever OERU learner support. Um, and so we, we, we approached this initially from the point of view of what are all the things we can do without using volunteers or two, what if we just have there as, as resources, just, just so that we don't rely too much on people and where we don't need them, where we could have other things. So some of the ideas that came up was uh, uh, providing self-study non-credit courses or learning uh, you know, uh, features. In, in, in the language of instruction of courses that could maybe even include also self uh, uh, marking language level testing. Uh, online academic integrity courses, uh, research skills, academic writing. We don't know how many students are coming in without those basic skills. Uh, information about OER and open pedagogies uh, uh, that are used to working in sort of traditional guide and support course they may need to have a better understanding of what that is. And why not just put that in there for all courses rather than in each individual course? Online career suggestions. Uh, uh, what As the program grows, which ones might they want to choose? And which possible programs outcomes would relate to the choices that they take? And then we decided for Rory's sake that we would let the academic board rule on that. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I think we're getting punchy. We're getting punchy. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> Remember to wake you can make it. And then, of course, peer support, uh, connecting uh, learners to other learners. 
Uh, warning to how to read terms and conditions that are not resources. And just kind of basic like internet uh, digital literacy in terms of how to uh, how to be how to um, understand what kind of tools you're using, what you're committing to, and what your privacy concerns might be when you're using the resources. Also, a technical problem is contact. So somehow people are writing technical problems. We still need to be some kind of contact. So how alert support will be implemented via ABI. So the first idea is, is the big button idea that there is uh, within courses. If you want help, you can, you can get in contact for those institutions that are interested and able to provide uh, tutorial support um, that, is, um, that they would actually pay for. You can have that built into the courses. Uh, we talked about volunteers. and, and uh, that, that was not an easy issue. There, pretty clearly, uh, I think when that concept first came up, that's before we saw the rise of all the, the big MOOCs. It was pretty much at the same time. So, like the Coursera MOOCs and the standards, and so on, edX. And uh, some of them started using volunteers, and, and it, it, there were definitely was some uh, um, negative reaction in sort of in, in the social media from faculty to feel like, you know, there's you know, the concerns faculty have about the sessionalization and so on. And so we just thought it was something to be aware of. You know, you could, could we get a negative backlash by over promoting a, a, a volunteer approach back? So that's not to say not to do it, but it's just something we need to be aware of and think about how that might work. Um, maybe as a volunteer, as a as one of a number of options, but not as the sole method. Um, uh, so student volunteers really trying to build that body as as well. Um, possibly you students have already completed a course and, and, uh, um, and um, have some badges need to be moderators for that area and by that we would actually have a mini course in, in online moderating uh, or, or peer support and actually have a badge available in that area. Um, tools such as peer video chat tools, a peer in is one of the ones that's used, that's a uh, great place that one, it's, it's a very cool one, it's very simple. Uh, for peer to peer, up to those, you know small groups that can use these things. Um, social annotating tools, uh, Reggie was just showing uh, the, the power of some of these tools where people can, can collaborate on discussing areas of a certain website or an article or whatever it might be. Um, we recommend uh, a number of different tools. I, I mean, Hypothesis is one of those. There are YouTube and video videos to support these tools. Be careful about pro providing our own discussion boards. It's something that we realize that you know, there's a lot of trolls in there. If it's not being moderated, what kinds of uh, uh, hazards are there that we put the OER into? Because at least in our own institutional online spaces, we have policy, we have student conduct rules. Um, how would that work if we provide the tools? Do we carry responsibility for that? So maybe the approach is more to, to recommend or have a list of, of, of uh, tools that they can potentially use, uh, but it's on their own. And we don't have to govern that. So listing action steps to improve OER uh, you learn support. Create a common student support area in the wiki. So the idea is let's have one spot where we put the resources rather uh, than sprinkle throughout all our different courses. Make an inventory of some of the best resources on the web and at partner institutions and link to them. Obviously, we want to do, uh, use a link checker regular so they don't go stale. Uh, where possible, archive them so that there's a good backup until we have a fairly strong set of commonly shared resources. And then we, when we get into our courses, rather than, because I know in one of the courses we put in, we actually put in information about what kind of tools to use and when and how to collaborate, but I think it would be better if we went through our courses and said, okay, so send them to that area for, for uh, maybe for checking the tools, as well as, of course, they, they have their own choice. That way we develop some commonality of, of, of tools that communication, collaboration tools that students are using. Um, and then the H5P framework is, is, is really getting the buzz these days in terms of a uh, very simple way of creating all kinds of uh, interactive and collaborative um, tools that, um, that students can use in the environments. Decision recommendations link to existing resources. Don't redevelop or place in the wiki. But I mean, but what you mean by place in the wiki is link them but don't actually they may have different licensing regimes, and, and also uh, they're best maintained in our own open in our own institutions because we automatically update them. 
So we want to keep it low maintenance. Uh, develop a common area in the wiki, as I mentioned. Uh, set up student ratings for tools, you know, maybe a five star system where over time we can see which ones we use and the recommendations. Uh, set up student surveys and recommendations on new tools. Um, um, Sandstorm uh, has a whole collection of different tools. And uh, prioritize priorities prior to launch. In other words, we have to figure out which of these are the most important pieces uh, and which ones we're going to do that's the case for the launch. I did that for you. Yeah, thank you. I could tell you did that for me, the English teacher. <laughs> any, any comments or thoughts? Again, as the, the, the OERU model, I mean, this is the first draft. We, we will refine them in the week as, as we move forward, the first meeting. And of course, everyone has the opportunity to engage in that process if you want to. So one of the things I'd just like to do before we move into discussing the or the next session is just to have a quick review of the issues for the CEO's meeting that I extracted out of the meeting from yesterday. Obviously, I haven't included today's, uh, today's stuff. Um, and there will be a small breakout group for a couple of executives now to start thinking about shaping that agenda in the next breakout. It's the next breakout session under um, the capable leadership of uh, Maxine. Um, so let's just have a look at what we've got at the moment. And it, it's really just to have a quick think now or a quick brainstorm on you know, are there issues we are missing from this list? Uh, and these are the ones I just extracted from the various documents in the wiki. Uh, the, the notion of resource allocation to help smooth the way, uh, you know, for well, not necessarily a Senate process, but uh, the, the process is to getting the credit transfer sorted. Uh, cost effectiveness and cost models. What is the role of academic board with respect to evaluation? I think that has uh, taken on a tiny new shape based on today's discussion. What steps need to be taken towards aligning accreditation? So I guess that also relates to the uh, due diligence steps uh, that we, we discussed earlier today. So the, the FAQs, um, the conversion of students dealing with us as open source collaborators into something more like members of our university communities. Uh, program design, how do we improve on our you know, program design, getting the right courses you know, in the mix, so to speak. Um, the learner support, so that's the ABI issues. Uh, challenges in understanding communications from OBRU. This is again the bars and the law and getting people up to speed. Uh, what can the network do to improve partner recruitment for better geographical representation, which was an important point that was raised early on the first day. Uh, what can the network do to communicate and demonstrate the cost of cost benefit advantages and strategic points of difference. How can partner institutions assist in getting the word out about OERU learning opportunities? This is kind of a, a brainstorm list uh, that we've got on the table at the moment and the breakout session will help refine that and focus it in terms of um, decisions that the CEO's meeting will need to have a think about. But are the issues, pressing issues that are in your mind that it should be discussed by the CEO's meeting tomorrow. This won't be entirely your last chance of being able to contribute because it's a very you can contribute the whole night if you want to. Um, but I think it's a good opportunity now just to ask that question. Well, the idea of a timeline, a deadline, I know that one group came up with March 15th. Um, you know, I guess there's going to have to be some thinking around, is, is that realistic, is that practical, is that manageable, is that doable, is it aspirational? Yeah, that's a good point. Given everything that has to be done? And prior to that, the finalising of that template that we use is the... Quite for the developing... Yeah, do you have that on us? That's, that's, no, that's going to be crucial. Of course, that line, yeah, of course, that line is having that standardised or a standard rather than Just the basic elements yeah, of what, yeah. of course, yeah. Because it's not too late to retro-engineer what we've got, but we don't just go too much further. Yeah. Yeah. 
Is that issue three? That should now say. Yeah, right? I, this, I, I don't think this is relevant anymore. Right. Yeah. In, 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 but we yeah. can yeah. tidy that up when we have the sort of the agenda shaping discussion. And the discussion we were having earlier on about the kind of split between the work on architecture and work on product is that something that needs to be discussed or is that or not? Those are the right terms. Um, the only one I would suggest is uh, a research strategy. So once everything goes, you know, live with the MVP, is there a strategy in place to make sure that you're collecting the right data from the start? Yeah. Motion, marketing. Okay, I'll guess that's just a little hashtag marketing. Uh, were you thinking marketing in that sense or well, marketing I, in the sense I, of? Well, the idea that we're not. You know, there's going to be a soft um, launch, and then there's going to be a hard launch at some point. So there's going to there's needs to be a marketing campaign created of some sort. And how are we actually going to get? It's one thing to talk amongst each other, but how do we get the word out? Yeah. The online institutions. Mm -hmm. So, uh, generally feeling comfortable with the list that is there at the moment. Um, the team will, will refine and, and focus and sharpen. Um, but these are kind of just the initial brainstorm ideas. Yeah. That, that item seven, I think it's, all, it's, it's also perhaps understanding the communications from and history of. Well, complicated things, but it makes yeah. a sense of what we discussed. So, communications. From and history of OER. It was, it was also the fact that it, you know, the, where do you point people to get the quick take? And, you know, that's the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So we'll, we'll leave it there for now. I'm sure there other things coming out this particular session now that we we'll need to inject in as well. Um, so the next component of the meeting is actually just taking a bit of a forward look now, looking a little bit uh, at some of the strategic issues uh, in OERU. And uh, really two areas, uh, well, uh, well, the big focus is of course the development and consultation of the next strategic plan, which will be 2018 to 2020. <coughs> And to, to give you a sense in terms of how we work on with the strategic planning process, obviously we've got the current strategic plan as a resource. Uh, the, the process of using this evergreen strategic planning model, you know, that the strategic plan is a living document, has actually worked quite well for us. Uh, and how we go about sorry about this. So this is the strategic planning portal that we had from the previous strategic plan. And basically how this works or how we how this works is we identify a number of the strategic goals that we are you know, aiming to 
target for the next phase. And those strategic goals are broken down into strategic objectives as a consultation in the wiki. And then we typically go uh, work through these phases. There's this open consultation process, to, uh, getting the discussion on and about the strategic goals. And the first attempt at thinking about some of those strategic goals will take place here. <coughs> it's really just that initial brainstorm, well, what are the key goals we want to be targeting for the next cycle of the OERU? Um, there's this open consultation which takes place over a period of time. So you can see, for example, how, how we structured it. There would be you know, a two-week period for each of the main goals, and there's open discussion about it. And, and then the synthesis phase where this is all pulled you know, together, and then the approval phase and the approval for the next strategic plan will be at the next partners meeting, right? Uh, so we'll have the consultation, the, the draft strategic plan will be tabled at the next partners meeting, discussed, refined, recalibrated <coughs> during the meeting, taken forward to the CEO's meeting. Uh, so that's how that process works. Um, and then of course the implementation with our, with our cycles each year. <laughs> So that's how we go about developing the strategic plan. Um, we may you know, also include a, a couple of, you know, sort of online web discussions as well to help support this process. But this is how we've done it traditionally. It worked well last time, so the open question is, is this a good way of doing it? Uh, shall we continue with this kind of consultation process for the next strategic plan? Andy? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think it worked very well. Okay, so that's uh, around the strategic planning process. And that's all I wanted to say at this stage. And what I'm going to do is uh, hand over to Dave, who will be chatting a little bit about some of the, the technology roadmap um, components. And then I can just disconnect this. You leave that there and I'll, I'll use yours just to avoid creating unnecessary complications. My laptop will live to do another day. <laughs> this latte enabled. Um, all right, so I'm going to quickly turn it in. oer.nz slash 18 should get into my presentation, should you want to follow along at home, or here in the room. Um, now, so yeah, we, we've, we've seen that um, Things have gone pretty well, I think, so far in the development of the technology um, platform underpinning the OERU. Um, but there's certainly plenty of room for useful uh, further innovation and further refinement. Um, one of the most commonly um, cited issues or concerns, particularly uh, on behalf of learners, um, that seems to also be a bit of a bugbear for uh, people contributing to the uh, OERU materials, is the concept of having to log in and create accounts on a myriad of systems. Um, so it's not a straightforward thing to achieve, um, but we're going to try to make it happen. In fact, I think we will make it happen. Um, our goal is that when a learner or an educator begins to, um, or decides that they want to get involved uh, in, in the OERU, either uh, using the services or helping to Develop the services that they can use the same credentials to log into all of the services to remove hassles. So the idea is, um, some of you will have seen on websites. You can go to them and you can either create an account laboriously by typing in all your details, or you can say log in with Facebook or log in with, with uh, Google um, or log in with some other service that you've already invested in um, heavily. Uh, those use a protocol called OAuth2. And so we are looking at adopting a similar protocol. Um, the way that it might manifest itself for a, uh, for a user would be something like this. Um, 
just imagine that there was some nice OERU branding instead of just a, brand, a gray button there. But the idea would be if you had a course login for, on the OERU course website because you were taking a course, those same credentials could then be used uh, without having to enter them again, but with all of our other services. So when you went to log into a service that you hadn't logged into before, for example, our chat or our forum or some other uh, one of our services, you would have the option of saying, use your existing credentials. You click on the button, and if you are already logged into the course website, which chances are you would be if you were a learner, um, then it would transparently just create a new account for you in that other service using the same credentials that you provided to access the course. So essentially, a single login for all of, all of our services. This is not a trivial undertaking. Um, we, uh, some, with some bravado, we thought we could do this relatively um, rapidly, and uh, subsequently we found out to our surprise that uh, we found it a, a, a bit more difficult, or I found it a bit more difficult than I initially thought it would be, but then I felt a little bit better when I found out that a number of our partners were uh, budgeting $4 million for doing something similar for their <laughs> organization, so it felt a little bit less. Uh, but I, I think we can do it for substantially less, and because of the kinds of tools we've selected, um, we don't have to contend with as many um, inconsistencies in the way they're implemented and so on. And the open source tools tend to try to use standards where possible. Um, oh, sorry, actually I forgot to advance the scene. Sorry, I was looking at it on my screen, but you're not seeing it. So that's the gray button that I was talking about. We would have something that maybe had some OERU branding so that it was more obvious to people that they were clicking on the right thing. Right. Um, another step forward would be uh, in additional um, work on analytics. So with any innovation, it's crucial for us to be able to determine in advance what success looks like. How do we know that we've succeeded with our platform? Uh, what we do from the start is to work out what that, what that looks like so that we can then build into our product or into our services the ability to measure whether or not we've achieved that success. A lot of organizations make the mistake of saying, well, we'll just produce something and we'll hope that people buy it or that people use it or whatever it might be. Um, but then they don't actually have any way of measuring whether people are using it or how they're using it or whether they're buying it, that sort of thing. So the key thing here is to, um, is to actually make sure that measurement is built in from, from day one. We've been working with an organization called Lunometrics, who are a web analytics company, um, thanks to a grant from the Hewlett Foundation. Uh, to integrate each of our course sites with uh, an analytics system that allows us to have very high granularity um, insight into how each of the course sites is being used. That includes things like the way that users interact with quizzes, for example, and whether they get the right answer the first time or whether they, uh, you know, which, which, which um, distractor they select first, if there's one that's particularly good or if there's one that they never select. You know, we have the ability to develop some insight into the quality of our, of our um, quizzing and stuff like that. Uh, all this stuff, all this, by the way, is anonymous, so it doesn't. Uh, we, we, we're very conscious of the fact that we want to avoid any privacy um, breaches or trust breaches. We want to actually be trustworthy, not just appear to be trustworthy. Um, we've already proven that the model of repackaging. We've already proven the model of repackaging OER view courses with the ability to uh, export them to WordPress sites. Um, but I think it might be useful for us to look at extending this to a couple of other target platforms. So among those could be some of the widely used LMSs that, that our members uh, are already using. Uh, but we also might look at doing things. Uh, ideally, we'll, we'll aim initially for investing in targets that are open standards uh, that are more widely applicable, like SCORM, for example. Um, similar, similarly, we could also repackage courses into static representations that can be distributed uh, and used offline, so that, um, or they can be hosted locally and used in places that are remote to, uh, to actual mainstream internet connections, but they might have local networks where students could collaborate around a, um, essentially a, a static um, version of, of materials. Um, this is one of the advantages of our disaggregated uh, services. 
and, and the fact that we can potentially help our, our partners offer uh, open boundary courses, even in conjunction with their closed uh, uh, learning management system. Um, we have actually got uh, an example of a community contribution, which I thought was worth, or Wayne and I both thought was quite worthy of mention that one of our partners has already, uh, of their own volition, um, worked out a way of creating one of these static exports from the wiki. So the same way that we're currently exporting courses to WordPress, uh, someone else has, has developed a, an independent implementation that will actually export into a static uh, linked uh, you know, interlinked set of HTML pages that can be used offline. So that, that already that's already available uh, in a, at least in the prototype form. Um, so I could just I could demonstrate that I believe uh, after this if anyone's interested. I have to go to myself, but I have I have a copy of it here. Um, so the OERU is already coordinating the efforts of educators to develop open educational resources or to assemble them. And uh, why not ensure that quizzes and assessments are created in conjunction with those resources um, becoming a, that could in turn become part of an integrated question bank. Um, if these were suitably categorized and uh, made searchable and easily recruited into other formulations for assessments, it might be interesting you could have approved questions, validated questions, that could then in turn be pulled into different remixes of those questions, of different assembly, assemblies of those questions for assessment. Um, over time, if we aggregate questions, especially uh, if some of our courses involve learners designing new questions and answers, we could create a valuable resource for online assessments. Um, this is also a potential revenue stream opportunity for our partners, uh, either the cost recovery or the problem. Um, Our online, assess our online assessment services represent a major opportunity in tertiary education. At the moment, these services are dominated by proprietary monopoly work, but so they are a great candidate for a more open pan sector approach and the disruption. Um, we think that these online question banks uh, could be an extension of Wiki Educator, and we are uh, evaluating open source delivery platforms like something called TAO, or it's <laughs> acutely backwards, it's actually online assessment technologies, but they Turned around for their acronym for some reason. Um, the beauty of an open source model like this is the ease of trialing solutions and being able to, dis to discard without any um, fretting over sunk costs those which fail to live up to their promise. Um, and we can we can help to build up those which show potential and to also be able to rapidly scale them up should they prove successful to, to meet the you know whatever kind of um, interest that we actually do see from the market. So you know, we can go from a prototype to a production uh, capability um, very, very rapidly in the course in a matter of days, potentially. So the, the idea is the cost of trying something and the risk of, of it failing are both very low. And so um, we can afford to take these kind of chances. Um, actually, I didn't mention, I didn't mention, uh, we're also looking at the moment, the quiz Format that's being used in Wiki Educator is uh, was created for for expedience rather than for um, standards compliance, uh, and so at the moment, creating a quiz in Wiki Educator um, uh, is kind of exclusive to the Wik to, to Wiki Educator. You wouldn't necessarily easily be able to use that elsewhere, although it does transfer to WordPress as part of our snapshotting process. But um, another another possibility would be for us to adopt the Moodle GIFT format uh, for quiz markup, um, which would have potentially some advantages. But again, this would increase the universality of, of the resources that we're generating. Um, another opportunity we see is to create a marketplace for the commercial ecosystem surrounding OER development. We can help to promote those who have demonstrated uh, their ability to create top quality resources for related services, including graphic design, um, video production, uh, project management, other kinds of um, services that would be of interest to all of our partners, I think. So um, that's an opportunity to um, really showcase those, those individuals who demonstrate those capabilities and, and make them uh, known to all of our partners. 
So yes, that's, those are some of the ideas we have at this stage. And uh, yeah, again, I'd like to acknowledge these organizations, or these groups, I should say. And again, you'll find this talk in my notes um, at that short URL that you can see there, oer.nz slash 18. And once more, this is a reveal.js presentation. <laughs> Just thinking about the web analytics um, setup, and I've not done that much about how you're approaching it. Um, but you wanted to make the observation really that you've got to be pretty careful there in terms of uh, interpreting what's happening, uh, as I'm sure you're aware. Um, mm -hmm. I, I'm an OU student at the moment, but I've just finished the master's degree. I'm a terrible student. Right? If you looked at my web analytics and what I actually do, don't log in, don't really do anything, but I'm confident that I can come in and you know, do the coursework or whatever. From an analytics point of view, it's a different story to what it could be. You know, um, it's not representing what's really happening. Also, a lot of the analytics stuff, um, it can be figured really, to, it's really testing something like user experience or the uh, ergonomics of the, of the site interaction. It's not really testing where the learning is happening. You can look at indicators of that. So I'm just saying there's, there's, you've got to be pretty cautious Absolutely. with that you know, sort of stuff. Um, but it seems like it's quite an important part of it because it's your only real feedback mechanism at the moment. Right? Yeah, well, it's, it's, a, it's a means for identifying friction in the process. And um, for example, for getting gross information like how many people start in a start in a course and then actually complete a session. And, and even just getting course information of course, in the not in the rough sense, um, indication of actual um, participation is already a big win because sure. there, historically a lot of systems might not have that kind of capability. And the fact that we can also be transparent about that provides uh, some really useful insight into other organizations developing similar kinds of systems. Um, but yeah, the, but the, the, the fact that we I mean, we certainly don't um, we certainly don't assume that that analytics will provide direct indication of learning outcomes. But we, we, we use them to uh, identify areas to investigate further and to get actual feedback or to you know, encourage actual, actual feedback. One, um, one way of testing your kind of, um, I suppose, the assumptions, the assumptions you're making about what's happening is actually to get some of those students into a lab and observe them and then see, okay, what we thought about, but does it really match up to mm. what, what's really going on, that kind of thing. So yeah, I'm sure you've thought about these things, but. Mm. Well, then there's also the potential opportunity, which this is widely used in the, in the online commerce industry, um, is things like um, doing A-B testing, where if, you're, if, you're, if you think that there's a, a fundamental blockage as a result of a certain way of presenting information, you can present it in two different ways, and you can then measure which way Achieves better completion. You can you can randomly present to each you know, each person involved in or taking a, a quiz, for example. Um, you can present it two different ways and, and measure which one is more effective. So, so but it, it does require a it's, a, it's a simple proposition when it's about how which is the more efficient way of transmitting information. It's the learning element that makes it much more complicated. Uh, that's that's a, just a sort of structural problem with. We, we, I, I see. I see the. I see the technology as the logs in this fire, and the flame is is difficult to. You, know, you can you never anticipate where the flame exactly is going to go, but you can you can you can tell by the way the logs wear down uh, where the learning um, is likely to be happening. When, in theory, the assessment does tell you whether people have actually learned or not, and then what you're doing is correlating activity. With Ultimate learning to try and draw lessons from that. It's more complicated now. We had a, uh, an ACO workshop that Charles Sturt earlier on this year, and we we're a blackboard site. It's interesting that one of the comments there was that the big issue is that blackboard's architecture doesn't match what academics actually do with it, or conversely, academics don't use blackboard in the way that blackboard intends, which means that a lot of the hours to get out of the system are not actually very useful. Um, I'm just wondering the same things here. I know there's uh, it's certainly been suggested about our place and a bit controversial about whether you do kind of micro sampling and student satisfaction on the way through the learning journey. So, you know, ask students whether they think they have learned something 
after the assessment, and that's in a data that you can get mm -hmm. as well. I can see that, yeah. I'm maybe, maybe waiting as Yeah, I mean, there's also a healthy dose of realism here. I mean, we're a small charitable organization, and you know, we've got this big learning analytics company. I mean, I, I very, very much doubt we'll ever sort of get into sort of dynamic analytics and try and change you know, how the sequences take place. But our, one of our last prototypes that we ran, which was actually quite interesting, we, we made a bunch of assumptions about how learners navigate through, uh, through the course materials, and sort of the design of our learning pathways and, and that sort of thing. And if you look at the analytics across the timeline when they first join the course, they're actually visiting the pages you would, you know, the, the concentrations are, they're visiting the pages that you would expect them to visit in the sequence of the course. And so a number of assumptions being made through the early sort of thinking about what, what is this, what are learning pathways and how do they look and what is a course guide. And it appears at least to be working. And so that, and that's good information to know because, I mean, you know what it's like, uh, everybody's uh, got an interest in design and how courses should be sequenced and this sort of thing. At least we can say, well, okay, I'm you know, design here, yeah, which is not that flash. Um, there's actually working. Yeah. There's one key difference between us and say, for example, um, your situation, Andrew, like the, the idea that um, you might gain some insight from analytics that Blackboard offer, but you then have to convince Blackboard to change their product to adapt to the, the behavior. Um, you know, the, the analytics might indicate doing things a different way, and you'd have to convince them to actually change their product. Whereas in our case, we have a much tighter feedback loop, and we can actually institute those changes rapidly and agilely without having a huge cost or market, um, you know, our stock value isn't going <laughs> isn't to plummet because we've decided to redesign this piece here and there. Um, so we can afford to do those, make those changes in a much more agile way than almost anyone else can. The other thing which is going to be useful for us, just given that we're global, because what, what lunar metrics will be implemented to something, is just a, a simple dashboard of UTC times that learners are actually accessing OERU, so to speak. So if there are partners that are thinking about providing some, you know, big button tutorial support services, we know where, where the times are and, and how they unfold within this, this network. We, we just don't know that stuff yet. Yeah. Being able to see where people are coming from as well is, is going to be quite powerful. Um, single sign-on, that's, I'm assuming that that's an optional thing. Yeah. Um, you both with that commitment. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. No learner will ever be denied access to any learning materials. We, we look at um, the, the logging in process is, is essentially a convenience for consistency of, of persona right. within within the system, not because you have to do that. It's only if you want to always appear as the same person when you make a comment or when you look at something. If you're looking at it anonymous, anonymously, you don't have to log in. And, you call. and we have to do it for control management. You, you, Got a forum and you know there's the training going on there. Uh, we have to have a method <coughs> that and you that you would need an identity. Well, it, it doesn't have you know, a, a, a user identity. Yeah. Because we have very strict terms around that. You you do what you do one and you're out. Finished. That would be <laughs> <laughs> okay. You talked about. Um, a way of converting the site to something that could be used on an intranet. Uh, yeah, yeah. So what implications does that have for any sort of student support services we might offer? Uh, well, if anything, it might, um, I would think that it would open up the possibility of a whole new um, market being able to recognize that you're uh, support services might be useful because uh, I would suspect that, that what what that kind of static uh, representations of these materials is likely to do is, is to meet the needs or, or to be an introduction to these materials to people who otherwise wouldn't have access to them under any circumstances. So if anything, I think it would only expand the potential market rather than, than, than reshuffle it, if that makes sense. But we wouldn't be able to link outside of the internet. For example, if they're in prison, 
system. So we've got our student support services all as links. Yeah, but means, then the student, those student support links would have to be replicated or like if, if, if they're static. But at a technical level, it's possible, yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, it gets a little bit difficult, and there are some uh, copyright issues because if you if you follow links that aren't on your own site and you create a static site, then you're actually copying copyrighted materials or that, what may be copyrighted materials. So it would be a situation in which the students might not be able to click on those links and have them go anywhere because they don't have access to the internet. Right, which, is, which means really, well, unless we're going to, at some point, develop our own student support services, then we can't really embed them within courses. We can't embed them. Just, I mean, we, no, you certainly can. No, you can, because your online version, you can. Yeah. yeah. I mean, ultimately, what's going to happen is the students will see a link that they click on and it doesn't go anywhere in this after And the next time that they do have access to the internet, maybe they'll follow that one up specifically. Oh, yeah. But the, ultimately, if they don't have access to the internet and they're doing it in a closed system, then. Um, yeah, there's, there's not really an easy way around that question. Sorry about, oh, sorry. Sometimes, yeah. Uh, I, I'm, I'm worried about SMS. Mm -hmm. And particularly, I know they, they, there are certain developing areas in the world that really use S, rely on SMS quite heavily for uh, online learning for uh, interaction and communication. <laughs> um, and so, in a low bandwidth area where if you have access to download the fixed, that version of the course, and uh, I don't know, maybe it's way off, but no, no, I know no. that it's with, it's with just, a platform like Mautic, for example, your your prompts that are automated from an instructor's perspective can actually be sent through a platform like Mautic. Yeah, yeah. SMS. I mean, you you need to you need to have <coughs> potentially some slightly tricky um, systems to reroute messaging to certain users as SMS rather than as email. For but that is certainly well within the realm of possibility. And I believe that um, the, our Rocket Chat platform, for example, um, has an SMS gateway capability so that the messages could be pushed out by SMS to alert people that something has occurred in the chat that might be um, of, their, of interest to them. But the challenge with that stuff is who pays for this? Uh, and, and that's going to dictate how it operates. Someone's got to find it. And the way that I've seen it work in many developing countries is where there's a sponsorship by one of the telcos or some big company, and then it's fine. There might be a lot of strategic mm -hmm. options. Yeah, I mean, I think the thing that we're the thing that we're seeing though is that, um, speaking from the technology point of view. The deployment or the, the degree to which people are gaining access or the rate at which people are gaining access to the internet around the world is so rapid that the time it takes us to build a solution to help people um, cope with not having access to the internet is likely to take longer than them getting access to the internet. And it's also, I mean, I'm, Dave, to draw sort of in, inferences from this kind of data. But Wiki Educator, which is a top 100k website, uh, over the last three years, access from mobile devices has increased from 17% to 37%. And a third of our visitors are from developing countries. Yeah, I can give some info. Probably Wayne and I can both give some insight as to the kind of people who are requesting Wiki Educator accounts at the moment. Almost all of them are. Well, they may be native English speaking, but they're from the subcontinent, a lot of them, and from uh, a lot of them are African and various other places, and almost all of those people are accessing the site with the cell phone. A follow up to that Are there any plans to move the Wiki Educator site to a responsive point? Uh, very, very uh, good question. What's the, I don't understand the question. Um, so, the current Wiki Educator theme uses. Um, Kind of a standard classic media wiki thing, the one that kind of was made famous by Wikipedia. It's the standard default theme. We actually, at our university, we just moved to a theme that works well on mobile devices, including for editing. Okay. Um, I, 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 I actually meant to ask you about that offline. I hope I'm not putting you on the no, 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 that's good. Um, But the, the one thing I was wondering that I could see being a complication is I know Wiki Educator uses a lot of templates. 
And my guess is that will create complications. Uh, the, 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 the short answer is that um, any change uh, that, that is that fundamental to the way that quick educator works is going to have some teaming pains. Um, but at the same time, I think it's, it's something we, we should look at. It has been looked at before. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. Although my gut, my gut feel is, I mean, this is just off the top of my head because I know the wiki well. Uh, I would say that uh, 85 to 90 percent of our templates would convert to a the, the, other, the, the other thing to keep in mind is that Wiki Educator is, um, is generally not a delivery platform. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things that having separate delivery platforms offers us is the ability to kind of, um, it, it allows us to tune the way that out, the output from a conversion, like a snapshotting process, is, is it, you can constrain the materials that get snapshotted more easily than you can go back through all the historical information that's in Wiki Educator yeah. and then make sure that it can all be amenable to um, responsive layouts. Is there anything about the snapshot process that would be disrupted by even updates? Uh, uh, we, 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 that's actually something I meant to mention is that we'll we'll be looking at potentially creating um, other other theming options for exporting as well, so that you don't have a sort of a one size fits all, and the only thing you can change is your is your Branding uh, or a few color changes. That we, we may look at another uh, other ways of doing it. Um, after the MVP, we'll, we'll focus some time on on type on it. Yes. So uh, the, the the media with the install we run at TRU, we just did an upgrade to a Bootstrap theme, and I'm very very pleased with how it came out. We did a number of uh, plugin and theme upgrade uh, plugin upgrades as extension upgrades as well. For well um, and and you know, maybe a rare opportunity we might actually be able to help you, which was <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's uh, that's uh, we love that. Let's book. Let's book an appointment to talk about that. Yes. Could there be a facility? Maybe you have it already, but after, after you take your module, um, I can't hear. When you when you take your module at the end. Uh, could there be a facility there where students could say this is a, a, a really great link and just link to anywhere on the web that uh, could be related to that particular uh, teaching point, learning point? Funny you should ask. This is pretty much exactly, um, I mean, Wayne, I think mentioned it yesterday. Yes, there was the, um, the bookmarking bookmarks. Yes, we have the, the technical. So, uh, so students or a teacher could come in. Uh, look at it, and at the end, there, click and say, "Go to this TED talk." Yep. So it, it, uh, they could say, um, "Hey, this is a great TED talk, and this is why I like it." Yeah. And share it with the group. Oh, here, yeah. here is here is the OERU bookmarking facility, mm -hmm. and in fact, this can be used by a tagging of the of the bookmarks that people submit. They can have their own personal collections of bookmarks using this. Exact site, so they can log, you know, they can log into the site and maintain their own set of bookmarks for course development, for example. But for or as a learner, they could have um, course-related links that they found uh, in the course of doing research. Can or then other students see that? Mm -hmm. yeah, 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 and they're all shared. They're all shared. And other students can vote for the other good ones that they, they like. Yeah, there's a thumbs up, and thumbs down thing there that you can use to, for people to provide you with feedback. But couldn't that get very busy? You have a thousand students taking that course. No, they're putting underlined and everything. <laughs> not necessarily. Not necessarily. It's designed to be segmented by by the fact that you can you can explore it by tags. So you can specify a particular topic area or a particular course, and each each link is, is intended to be so tagged appropriately. So I I'm reading this paragraph and I say I know a TED talk that relates directly to that. I can. Highlight it and uh, yes. put it up, put in a link, and um, you can't specifically you know, be pointed at a particular part of the course, but that's something we should potentially look at. But the technology to do that exists. No, I, I'd be a bit concerned if you could do that because <laughs> that's when you'd get it really busy and everything. I was thinking at the end of a section. But the thing is, I think things about a Google a Google page is quite busy because. The, Another ten thousand pages behind the yes, page. You, yes. It's the same thing here. Uh, you, you could sort by date or sort by popularity, and, and, and so you will only see the, the ten that you're looking at or whatever. Yes. Students well, are using this sort of stuff if they go already in courses. 
Yeah. Yeah. Standard kind of practice. So the, the beauty of this is that it's oh yeah, you linked. Yes, yes. I, um, I, I think what I, I see is the uh, the OER is OER CC by, and that's the full course. And this is for ancillary material. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. That doesn't necessarily have this to be another layer of mind. We, we actually, in a number of courses, we build that approach in as the pedagogy. Yes. Where we get the learners to go out and find the site. But, but um, you, you're also, have, have any of you ever seen a website called Medium? Mm -hmm. You're that blogging site? Medium allows you to go to any paragraph and to click on a, on a, a line that you thought was particularly poignant or relevant or something, and you can then leave a comment on that line, but it's very subtle, and you, you can read through the whole thing and not realize anyone's done that, but if you look through it again, you can see that some some lines people have commented on, you get a whole discussion about the, the line, and that kind of technology is, is something that over time maybe we could incorporate, but that may or may not be mm -hmm. worth doing, you know, if we can decide if that's the case. All right. Thank you very much, Dave. Pleasure. So, beginning to the point, this is pretty much our uh, going to be our last breakout uh, session of the meeting. So, we've done well, we've got this far. I hope the jet lag is not too bad, I'm, but I'm sure folk have, have recovered and are in the local zone now. Um, so, as, as I said, the, the purpose of this, this breakup is to actually just start populating some of the strategic thinking in terms of moving forward. The first group that um, we've, we've allocated is just to have a brainstorm of what should the strategic goals and strategic objectives be for the next cycle. So, that's 2018 to 2020. Just a show of hands, anybody that's going to help us with strategic goals? What are the others? Oh, okay. No, fair enough. You need to see the others before we decide. Yeah. No, I fully accept that. I fully accept that. Yes. Is there a group that has no topic? And we don't do anything? That's my group. We have a nap? That's my group. So the second group is the technology group. Um, you know, just think about some of the roadmap things. And again, it's slightly longer term. Right? It's not sort of next year, right? Um, we need to have a couple of the executive folk who will be at the CEs meeting just to help us shape the, the agenda uh, for the CEs meeting tomorrow. Um, and then the last group, oh, which I haven't mentioned, we, we, will be, uh, we will be introducing the process evaluation. Remember at the first meeting, the, the context input process of product evaluation, there is a, a draft uh, process evaluation plan. Again, it's, it's, it's a draft. We've got uh, a USQ helping us out with uh, that process evaluation. And there's a sort of a draft high level plan. And we, had, uh, we want to have a breakout here just to start thinking about what are the kinds of questions that should be incorporated in both the you know, fixed surveys as well as the sort of the open ended questions. For the process evaluation and the process evaluation is not only about the learning experience the pedagogy it's also about the development process how does you know the OER, your operations work so it's you know, a broad brush looking at evaluating our processes and to have a look at where we want to find so that's the fourth group so let's just do the quick check to see if we've got viable groups anybody can help out with strategic goals okay that's a viable group uh, technology, great, that's a viable group. Uh, executive leaders, yeah, we have the executive leaders, so that's good, that's a viable group. The process evaluation, mm -hmm. oh, yeah, it, it's, it, it's life, right? It's life. Okay, so what, uh, what we'll do with the process evaluation, the process plan is there, I will communicate with the, the network saying, Go and take a look. This is what we've got so far. Let us know. Okay. Great. So 
So maybe the executive group here, because then I can help the cause. Um, and then <coughs> the other two groups can decide where they want to come in. Yeah. 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 Highlights some of the key 